Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, lunchtime lecture sponsored by the Friends of the Bodleian. Uh, I am Richard McCabe, the current chair of the uh, Advisory Council of the Friends, and uh, I would invite anyone uh, joining us who is not a member at the moment to consider becoming a member, because all of the money we raise uh, goes to uh, acquisition and conservation in the Bodley. And while uh, these lectures are open to everyone, we have many events exclusively for um, our, our friends. Now, I'm delighted to say that our principal speaker this afternoon is Andrew Gant, who was an uh, organist, a choir master, and a composer at Her Majesty's Chapel Royal for 13 years until 2013 and is currently a lecturer in music at St. Peter's College here in Oxford. Andrew originally studied at St. John's College, Cambridge, where he was a choral scholar, and at the Royal Academy of Music. And he did his PhD in, the composition, um, uh, in composition and 20th century music at Goldsmiths uh, College. His research interests include the history and context of church music, and the place of music in contemporary society. Um, he has published two studies with profile books, Christmas Carols from Village Green to Church Choir and O oh, Sing Unto the Lord, a history of English church music. He is currently working on a history of music at the English Chapel Royal. Now today, Andrew will speak to us about the making of Handel's Messiah. And for us, that's a highly appropriate topic since the composer's own uh, conducting score is held at the Bodley and Martin Holmes uh, will be saying something uh, about that uh, later in the talk. And for those who wish to follow up on the talk, as Richard Parfitter says, the making of Handel's Messiah, Andrew's uh, book uh, on the, the, the topic is available to buy online for the Bodley at the special discount. So without further ado, uh, I will pass you over now to Andrew Gand. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Richard. And thank you very much, Richard. And it's very nice to join such a great uh, turnout, no doubt from all over the world. Um, very pleased to hear that you'll be able to uh, purchase copies of my new book about Messiah at a discount. I'm very pleased to hear that it's not too big a discount. Um, it's great to be talking to you about Handel. It was his birthday yesterday, as I'm sure you all know. And also, as Richard uh, has mentioned, although many people are well qualified to talk about Handel, I do have a, a small claim to authenticity, which is that the post that Richard mentioned there at the Chapel Royal, which I had the honour to hold, was indeed one of those held uh, in previous years by Handel, among many others. Messiah stands alone in the words of one of the greatest modern Handelian scholars, Donald Burroughs. The piece is unique, but it's important to note that in many ways, each of Handel's oratorios is also unique. The Danish scholar Jens Peter Larsen, who has written about Messiah says, Handelian oratorio is not simply a stage in the general development of oratorio, but to a great extent, a unique art form. Each piece is different. Each piece is new in its own way. There are many examples of that. So first of all, what is oratorio? Well, it was described like this by Handel's contemporary, the, the waspish and witty commentator Horace Walpole. Handel has set up an oratorio against the operas and succeeds. And he puts it in an important context there that sacred oratorio in a way only came into existence in England because the opera theatres were closed during Lent and impresarios and performers wanted to continue to feed and profit from the uh, public appetite for music when they weren't allowed to go to the opera. Walpole goes on. He has hired all the goddesses from farces and the singers of roast beef from between the acts of both theatres with a man with one note in his voice and a girl without ever and one. And so they sing and make brave hallelujahs and the good company encore the recitative if it happens to have a cadence like what they call a tune. That's Walpole. In slightly more serious vein, the mid 18th century was the great age of dictionaries of uh, Diderot in France and uh, Dr. Johnson in England. James Grassino published a musical dictionary in which he says this, 
oratorio, a sort of spiritual opera full of dialogues, recitatives, duettos, trios, ritonellos, choruses, etc. The subject thereof is usually taken from the scripture or is the life and actions of some saint, etc. The music for the oratorio should be in the finest state and most chosen strains. The words here offer often in Latin, sometimes in French and Italian, and among us, even in English. These oratorios are used at Rome in time of Lent. Here, indeed, they are used in no other season. So once again, Grassino is uh, making us aware of the point that the oratorio was a, um, a Lenten um, occurrence. There are antecedents in Handel's work. As a young man during his four-year trip in Italy, he wrote a work called La Resurrezione for Easter Sunday in 1708, with some obvious parallels with the theme of the later work. Um, and here is a splendid portrait of our man. Um, it's important also to note something that may come as a bit of a surprise in our later age, which is the very idea of sacred oratorio was extremely controversial. The idea of singing a sacred text in a theatre was very upsetting to the uh, puritanical tendency. For example, Handel's oratorio Esther, based on an Old Testament story, was performed in 1731 by Bernard Gates, the Chapel Royal Choirmaster, and was then repeated in a room at the Crown and Anchor, which was a tavern. Charles Burney, great commentator on musical matters, reported that the Princess Royal was pleased to express a desire to see it exhibited in action at the Opera House in the Haymarket by the same young performers. But Dr. Gibson, then Bishop of London, would not grant permission for its being represented on that stage, even with books in the children's hands. So that's an interesting little detail there that the bishop wouldn't let his choir boys do it. He wouldn't let them sing sacred words on stage even though they were actually pretending that, well, look, we're not really acting, we're just holding the books in our hands as if we're giving a concert, but that wasn't good enough for the bishop. Um, however, Bernie records Mr. Handel the next year, however, had it performed at that theatre with additions to the drama by Humphreys, but in still life, that is, without action, in the same manner as oratorios have been since constantly performed. So you're trying to pretend that you're not actually performing a show in a theatre. That's picked up in this newspaper advert for that performance of Esther. And you can see it says here, NB, there will be no action on the stage, but the house will be fitted up in a decent manner for the audience, the music to be disposed after the manner of the coronation service. Um, and there's a great deal more of this kind of thing in the public prints. We turn now to this handsome fellow. This is Charles Jennings, the libretto of Messiah. Jennings was a wealthy landowner. He was also a non-juror. He refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the Hanoverian monarchs, which meant that he was not allowed by law to hold any kind of public office, which left him as a well-educated man with lots of money and not very much to do. He describes himself as born and bred in Leicestershire mud. He was also the victim of what were described in his funeral oration in 1773 as perturbations and anxieties of the mind and not infrequently an extreme lowness and depression of spirits. A complex character then. And this is captured in his uh, lengthy and voluminous correspondence, a lot of which uh, survives. In summer 1735, Handel wrote to Jennings, I received your very agreeable letter with the enclosed oratorio. I'm just going to Tunbridge, yet what I could read of it in haste gave me a great deal of satisfaction. I shall have more leisure time there to read it with all the attention it deserves. There is no certainty of any scheme for next season, but it is probable that something or other may be done of which I shall take the liberty to give you notice, being extremely obliged to you for the generous concern you show upon this account. This is a reference to the first collaboration between Jennings and Handel, the oratorio Saul. Jennings typically wrote to his friend Edward Holdsworth, on Handel's emerging music for Saul. Mr. Handel's head is more full of maggots than ever. 
I found yesterday in his room a very queer instrument, which he calls carillon, and to say a bell. And with this cyclopean instrument, he designs to make poor Saul stark mad. I could tell you more of his maggots, but it grows late and I must defer the rest till I write next, by which time I doubt not more new ones will breed in his brain. This is Gopsall Hall in Leicestershire, uh, Jenin's family home. And so the relationship continued. In 1741, Jennings wrote again to Holdsworth. Handel says he will do nothing next winter, but I hope I shall persuade him to set another scripture collection I have made for him and perform it for his own benefit in Passion Week. I hope he will lay out his whole genius and skill upon it, that the composition may excel all his former compositions as the subject excels every other subject. The subject is Messiah. Later that year, Handel wrote to Jennings from Dublin, your humble servant intended your visit in my way from Ireland to London, for I certainly could have given you a better account by word of mouth as by writing how well your Messiah was received in that country. And I think we can find Handel being, although he was famously prickly himself, rather the more emollient partner in this correspondence. He tactfully refers to it as your Messiah. Jennings wrote again to a friend, he has made a fine entertainment of it, though not near so good as he might and ought to have done. I have, with great difficulty, made him correct some of the grossest faults in the composition, but he retained his overture obstinately, in which there are some passages far unworthy of Handel, but much more unworthy of the Messiah. In another letter, Jenin says, as to the Messiah, tis still in his power by retouching the weak parts to make it fit for a public performance. And I have said a great deal to him on the subject, but he is so lazy and obstinate that I much doubt the effect. And then when he heard it, his Messiah has disappointed me, being set in great haste, though he said he would be a year about it and then make it the best of all his compositions. I shall put no more sacred words into his hands to be thus abused. Not an easy partner then. Here is one of these uh, letters, uh, only about a couple of dozen of Handel's letters survive on a wide variety of subjects. July 1744, but have a look at this sentence in the middle here. Be pleased to point out those passages in the Messiah which you think require altering. So Handel once again is trying to be um, emollient towards his irascible librettist. Also, I think worth noticing how he has signed it at the bottom here. Your most obedient servant, George Frederick Handel. And then he's clearly decided to try and squeeze in the words and most humble uh, afterwards, and there isn't enough room for it. Jennings wrote to, to a friend, Handel has promised to revise the oratorio of Messiah and he and I are very good friends again. And he then points out why he thinks this is. The reason is he has lately lost his poet Miller and wants to set me at work for him again. Uh, this is because Handel worked with a large number of wordsmiths, including one called James Miller, who had written the words to his oratorio Joseph and his brethren, but Miller had then died. Jennings goes on, religion and morality, gratitude, good nature and good sense had been better principles of action than this single point of interest, but I must take him as I find him and make the best use I can of him. So moving on to Handel's method, um, as has been hinted at in some of these letters, uh, the principal yearly routine was to compose works during the summer months to go as it were into the bank, to use Donald Burroughs phrase, to be taken out and then put into the season. And it, it's a pattern that many later composers also observed, compose during the summer, perform during the winter. Um, Messiah was written astonishingly quickly. This is a page, indeed the last page, of the composition score. At the bottom here, you can see it says Fine del Oratorio, G.F. Handel, and here's the date using this rather strange um, astrological uh, symbol. Um, there are similar dates at the beginning and end of all three parts of the Messiah. Angefangen, he often lapses into German when he's in a rush, Saturday, August the 22nd, 1741, part one completed August the 28th, part two completed September the 6th, Part three completed September the 12th, 
And then at the bottom here, ausgefühlet, which literally means filled up, referring to putting in the inner parts, writing in the words, that sort of thing. Uh, the 14th Jesus, the 14th of this, in other words, of September. So the entire piece, beginning to end in full score, was written between the 22nd of August and the 14th of September. An absolutely astonishing achievement, not least given the quality of the work, of course. There are two principal sources, um, and before handing over to, to Martin to talk about the, the, the Tenbury manuscript, um, this just gives a tiny indication of the thrilling character of the actual composition score. You can see Handel's white hot inspiration at work in the crossings out and the, how furiously his pen scribbles across the page as he thinks of something and then thinks of something else. Also, if you look carefully, there are some very interesting changes. This is the very end of the piece. The last two words, amen, amen, and before it, that wonderful pause. But before that is this chord. Now, this is a chord of A major, which is the dominant of the main key, D major. I won't get bogged down in too many technical terms. But when he first wrote that chord, the bottom note was an A. The chord was in root position. He then changed it to make that bottom note a G. So the chord is a dominant seventh in third inversion. And he's then had to change the, the, the part writing to, to make that dissonance resolve properly. And we can actually see one of the most striking and amazing and wonderful effects in the whole piece emerging from Handel's working method. It's a thrilling document and every page contains things of that kind. Um, at this point, I will hand over to Martin Holmes, who is going to talk to us a little bit about the other principal source of Messiah. Thank you, Andrew. Um, okay, my name is Martin Holmes. I'm the curator of music at the Bodleian Libraries. And uh, I, as Andrew said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Bodleian source. Um, I'm just going to see if I can share my screen. Okay, <clears throat> so as Andrew said, the Bodleian holds one of the two most important sources for Messiah in the form of the conducting score, which complements the uh, original composing score in the British Library. Our score is also known as the Tembury Manuscript because it once belonged to Sir Frederick Ousley, who founded St Michael's College Tembury Wells in the middle of the 19th century. Ousley had been something of a child prodigy, composing an opera at the age of eight, but he was ordained in 1849 and thereafter combined his musical gifts with his ecclesiastical calling. He used to say that he was a hopeless preacher and no good at parish work, so he decided to play to his strengths and devote his life to reforming the music and liturgy of the church. He therefore established St Michael's as a model choir school with the aim of improving standards of Anglican liturgy and cathedral music at a time when both were at a very low ebb. As a baronet and a man of considerable private means and influence, whose godfathers had been the Dukes of Wellington and York. He was simultaneously Heather Professor of Music here at Oxford and Canon Precentor of Hereford Cathedral, whilst also involved in the running of his establishment at Tembury. Oosley was a musical scholar and collector, and he built up what was probably the country's most important collection of music in private hands. At his death in 1889, his library became the college's library, and after after the college closed in 1985, the bulk of the collection came to the Bodleian. An inscription on a flyleaf indicates that the Messiah manuscript was given to Oosley by Captain Edward J. Otley, one of the Tembury trustees in 1869. Information about the manuscript appears on other flyleaves of volume one in the hands of two of the distinguished former librarians of Tembury. E.H. Fellows, as here, another famous musician poet, but a musician priest, I mean, and Harold Watkin Shaw, whose pioneering and ubiquitous edition of Messiah was a result of his meticulous study of the score in his care. It seems likely that the manuscript was in use initially unbound, since the first few leaves of the overture are missing, and the first extant leaf is quite grubby, suggesting it lacked any protection at that stage. The manuscript is currently bound into two volumes, the first containing part one, with parts two and three bound together in the second volume. 
Parts of the former bindings were preserved when Oosley had the volumes rebound when he acquired them in 1867, and these were eventually pasted inside the new covers in 1930. The volumes were repaired in 1921 at the Royal Library in Windsor, and further paper repairs were undertaken in the 1950s. The leaves were deacidified in 1975, uh, 1974 alongside some other conservation work. So what is this conducting score? The Tembury manuscript is the first neat copy made from the autograph composing score during September and October 1741, before Handel set off for Dublin. It was written out by Handel's assistant, John Christopher Smith, a friend from Handel's early days in Germany, whom he invited to join him in England around 1716 to help manage his musical and business affairs. Many similar performance copies exist for Handel's major works, either copied by Smith or his son, also John Christopher, or a small circle of other copyists. Handel took this score to Dublin for use in the preparation of the first performances in April 1742, and for all his subsequent performances until his eyesight failed. It probably sat on his harpsichord as he directed those performances, and may then have been used by Smith Jr. and others from the Handel circle for a while after the composer's death. It's a multi-layered document containing changes and annotations in various hands, many by Handel himself, made over several years. It's quite clearly a working copy, which shows, if nothing else, that Messiah was not a static work. It evolved over time, and there is no definitive correct version. Changes had been made even by the time of the Dublin premiere, so that performance so that performance was not a literal portrayal of the composer's original conception as represented by the autograph score in its original state. Over time, some superseded sections were removed from the manuscript and different versions of arias made to suit different singers inserted into the score. Notes in the margins give the names of singers or sometimes indicate transpositions needed for particular singers so that copyists could create the necessary performing parts. Some of these relate to the Dublin first performances, others were added later. In 1749, Handel added ripieno and senza ripieno markings throughout the score to indicate passages where full and reduced orchestral forces were employed on that occasion. Other odd corrections appear in various places, including some to the text in Jenin's hand. Some of these features can be seen in the very first number, Comfort Ye. We have Senza Ripieno at the head of the score, cancelled by Con Ripieno um, Piano, um, as the, just at the singer's second bar. Several names appear in red crayon throughout the manuscript, as here with Mr. Lowe, and from what is known of the personnel, these must have been added between 1749 and 1751. The first major insertion in Handel's spidery hand comes at folio 20 of the first volume. This is an alternative setting of But Who May Abide the Day of His Coming, composed in 1750 for the famous castrato singer Gaetano Guadiani. Handel writes that name in ink at the top of the page, and several other singers are mentioned, crossed out or erased in other hands relating to various different performances. So apart from Guadagni, the singers Miss Brent, Miss Young, and Signor Recciarelli, and uh, these sang in Foundling Hospital performances right towards the end of Handel's life. But Miss Brent's name also probably relates to those late performances. There's also an indication that the aria was transposed on occasion into a different key, presumably at the request of a particular singer. So a note higher in E minor, and G flat probably refers to the G minor version, which follows this one in the score um, arranged for soprano. Here's another page from that aria, which gives the impression it was written out at great haste with notes literally flying off the page. Part two opens the second volume of the manuscript with Behold the Lamb of God. And then a little later, in that volume, there's another important insertion in the composer's hand at folio 57, Thou art gone up on high. Again, this is a version written for Guadagni.
The name Galley also appears in Handel's Hand here. Caterina Galley is known to have sung between 1749 and 1754, and there are a few other annotations probably added by Smith Jr., possibly after Handel's death. Part three begins on folio 98 with I Know That My Redeemer Liveth. And here again, we have some annotations. Very faintly at the top, you can make out La Francesina, which refers to Elizabeth Duparc, who sang at the 1745 King's Theatre performance. The boy presumably refers to some poor anonymous treble who didn't warrant a name. And then we have Signora Avolio, which may refer to the Dublin premiere or to early London performances. And Signora Frasi, written again in red, so added around 1750. So what happened to the score after Handel's death in 1759? Left both the autograph messiah and the conducting score with the music books to Smith, who then bequeathed them to his son at his death in 1763. When Smith the Younger gave up his own oratorio activities in 1774 and retired to Bath, he passed his collection of Handel autographs to King George III for the royal collections. At the younger Smith's death in 1795, the conducting scores stayed in the family, passing to Smith's stepdaughter, Martha Cox, who by that time was Lady Rivers. They were finally sold in 1851, following the death of Lady Rivers' son, Sir Henry Rivers, and they eventually made their way to Hamburg. At some point, the Tenbury Messiah became separated from the rest, possibly because it had been superseded by another copy. Although the precise sequence of events in these years is a little hazy, it's likely that the manuscript passed to Lady Rivers on Smith's death, then was at some point acquired by William Young Otley, keeper of prints and drawings at the British Museum, since the score appears in the sale catalogue of Otley's music collection in 1838. Whether Otley bought it at Ray Lady Rivers' sale in 1835 or earlier, we don't know. Otley's sale catalogue seems to indicate that it was bought for the price of one guinea by someone with the name of Warner, which is likely to have been Otley's brother, Warner Otley, so it appears then to have stayed in the family. The Otley family's dubious connections with West Indian slavery resulted in them profiting substantially from compensation for the freeing of slaves during the 1830s. As we have seen, in 1867, the manuscript was then presented to Oosley by Warner's son, Captain Edward J. Otley, one of the founding trustees of St. Michael's College, as indicated by the inscription inside the first volume. So the score is now one of the treasures of the music collections. And although much detailed work has been done on the manuscript over the years, and despite the fact that its rebindings have removed a lot of the evidence, there is still plenty to be learned from it. Scholars continue to study it and refine our understanding of what it reveals about this, one of the most famous of all musical works. Thank you very much indeed, Martin, for a fascinating insight into a, a wonderful document. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about Handel's uh, compositional method. It was commonplace in the Baroque for composers to borrow, indeed pinch, music from other pieces, um, from their own or indeed from other peoples. Uh, for example, Handel's Oratorio Israel in Egypt uh, contains something like 70% of music which had already featured in, in other, other pieces, many by, by other composers. Messiah, this is one of the ways in which Messiah is unusual in Handel's work in that it contains relatively little borrowing and all of it from Handel's own music um, and all of it from one category in Handel's own music, secular Italian duet cantatas, most of which he composed as a young man in Italy and one of which is a later composition um, from actually just shortly before he wrote Messiah. That music um, reappears in Messiah as for unto us a child is born. And I, I think it's actually quite interesting to note that though the choruses in Messiah are in four parts, a lot of them begin with polyphony in two parts. And that's a good example of it, which gives a lot of them this wonderful lightness and clarity of texture. And then what Handel added is those wonderful homophonic outbursts of choral texture, wonderful counselor, which of course are not part of the original um, uh, duet. And it's a good indication of how Handel's compositional method works. 
the original scores of the composition manuscript reveal some other fascinating in, in, um, aspects as well. Um, Handel's spelling is often a bit erratic. The word strength is spelt throughout with the last two uh, letters the wrong way round, HT. The word throne is written without the H, just as trone. He muddles up the words death and dead. Uh, he writes out were as a two syllable word, as in there were shepherds, as in the German, vera. Um, Kryath becomes a single syllable, kreith. Um, uh, and perhaps most puzzling of all for later performers, his word setting can often be rather um, eccentric. Right from the word go, singers and publishers struggled with making the words of that beautiful aria, I know that my redeemer liveth, actually fit with the music in a way that made sense of the words. And you know, right from Handel's own time, including uh, Jennings himself and John Christopher Smith, um, made alternative versions of how those words fitted. Um, perhaps the biggest problem of all is in the bass aria, the trumpet shall sound, where Handel consistently sets the word incorruptible as if it's stressed on the fourth syllable, incorruptible, which to our ears sounds completely daft. Although I have to say, I have a suspicion that we should at least entertain the possibility that perhaps pronunciation has changed and actually that is how the word was pronounced in Handel's day. Anyway, it's a fascinating insight into how the man's mind worked and uh, clearly when his, he was on fire with inspiration and working quickly, his mind reverted to, to German usage. A lot of those misspellings are to do with the th, which in English is th, but in German is t, uh, and that's Clearly, his mind goes back to reading those those uh, pairs of, of letters in the German manner. We should also remember that English was actually not his second language. It was actually his fourth. He traveled in Italy. He wrote many of his letters in French, as an educated man would be expected to do um, before coming to London. But his relationship with the English language was always a bit semi-detached. And it's one of the things that gives this wonderful uh, the ebullient character, uh, so much of his fascination. So we'll just whiz through the rest of the history of this wonderful piece in Handel's life. It was premiered in Dublin. Not entirely clear why, but it seems to have been a speculative uh, trip on Handel's uh, part to just, it was a, a, a growing city with a, uh, a big public and he thought he'd try his hand out there with a concert season. Uh, he travelled in late 1741, by which time he had already composed Messiah and had it copied. Um, Charles uh, Burney has a wonderful story about what happened when Handel was laid over in Chester waiting for the weather to change so he could get his boat and had a run through of Messiah with some local singers, one of whom kept getting it wrong and Handel stormed at him. I thought you said you could read music at sight, to which the poor man said, yes, I can, sir, but not at first sight. Um, may or may not be true, but it's a good story. He arrived in Dublin in uh, November 1741. This is a map of Dublin at the time, an elegant, elegant and fast growing uh, city. Um, the uh, singers that he used in his Dublin performance are of interest. One of the things about Messiah is that it has solos for four uh, voices. So it can, and indeed often is done with four singers, but Handel used no fewer than nine in his first performance. They're also, they're quite varied. He brought with him one of his principal operatic uh, sopranos, who Martin's already mentioned, Cristina Avoglio, one of many Italians who sang for him in London. But his alto was Susanna Kibber, who was better known as an, as, as an actress, and indeed for some of her other activities, including um, uh, um, her lover being sued by her husband in a very salacious court case. Um, and the men were mostly cathedral lay clerks. The performance was in the new music hall in Fish Amble Street. The season began with other works and then in late March came an announcement in the papers. For the relief of the prisoners in the several jails and for the support of Mercer's Hospital in Stephen Street and of the charitable infirmary on the Inns Quay, on Monday the 12th of April will be performed at the Music Hall in Fishamble Street, Mr. Handel's new grand oratorio called The Messiah. As was 
traditional at the time. There was also a rehearsal for which tickets could be purchased and was reviewed. Mr. Handel's new grand sacred oratorio called The Messiah gave universal satisfaction to all present and was allowed by the greatest judges to be the finest composition of music that ever was heard. It went on to request that ladies should come to the concert without hoops, as it will greatly increase the charity by making room for more company, and then adding, in the spirit of equality, gentlemen are desired to come without their swords. The fact that it was performed in a building described as a music hall is interesting as well. This was a new invention in the 18th century, the purpose-built music room. And of course, we have the oldest and one of the finest examples right here in Oxford, in the Hollywell. So if you imagine that plain, white, beautifully lit, but not very big space, you get some idea of the kind of room that Handel may well have been writing for. Handel uh, left Ireland in August 1742, saying he was pleased with my success in general in that generous and polite nation. Messiah caught on rather slowly back in London. Um, there, uh, at the Covent Garden Theatre on the 23rd of March was a new sacred oratorio with a concerto on the organ and a solo on the violin by Mr. Dubourg advertised not as Messiah, but as a sacred oratorio, another indication of this rather uh, curious uh, reluctance to admit sacred words, although the title sacred oratorio, frankly, is if anything even more provocative than the name Messiah. Jennings reported, Messiah was performed last night and will be again tomorrow, notwithstanding the clamour raised against it, which has only occasioned it being advertised without its name a farce, which gives me as much offence as anything relating to the performance can give the bishops and other squeamish people. Tis, after all, in the main, a fine composition, notwithstanding some weak parts, which he was too idle and too obstinate to retouch, though I used great importunity to persuade him to it. He and his toad-eater Smith did all they could to murder the words in print, but I hope I have restored them to life, not without much difficulty. Handel planned six performances in 1743, but gave only three, and none at all in 1744, to the great disappointment of his great friend and supporter, Mrs. Delaney, who was by this time married to Patrick Delaney, who had been the Dean of Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin. Mrs. Delaney wrote to a friend, we went together last night to Joseph. It was the last night, and I think I prefer it to everything he has done except the Messiah. In another letter, she says, last night, alas, was the last night of the oratorio. It concluded with Saul. I was in hopes of the Messiah, although it was performed that season independently by the Academy of Ancient Music. Handel gave Messiah twice in 1745. Uh, there were th these were theatre performances in Covent Garden and the King's Theatre Haymarket. And this is a picture of the King's Theatre in Haymarket. Uh, one of the two theatres in London at the time, naturally much smaller than the theatres that we're used to today. Much rebuilt because they kept burning down over the years. Messiah was then not heard in London at all for three years. Covent Garden performances followed in four consecutive seasons from 1747. May 1749 brought an important event in the history of Messiah. Handel was asked to do a fundraising concert for a new institution, a hospital for orphaned children being set up by Thomas Coram, and he did so. And the following year, 1st of May, 1750, he gave the first performance of Messiah in the chapel at Coram's hospital. A newspaper reported that this event attracted an infinite crowd of coaches carrying a very numerous audience who expressed the greatest satisfaction, and it was repeated on the 15th of May. This is a picture of the chapel of the Foundling Hospital. This picture was made some 50 years after Handel's death, but it gives a good idea of the size and style of the chapel. If you think about a church like uh, St. Martin in the Fields with these high galleries and high windows and this rather magnificent triple-decker pulpit, which is such a feature of 18th century churches. But most of all, just have a look up in the gallery at the back there. These are the charity children. There are hundreds of them. 
<laughs> and they were a bit of a, a spectator attraction of the ladies and gents would come along and, uh, and look at them and listen to the music, which was often of a very high standard. 1751, there was a performance at the Foundling Hospital, but not at Covent Garden, where the oratorio season was curtailed by the death of the Prince of Wales. And thereafter, from 1752 until his death, every year Handel presented Messiah both at Covent Garden and at the Foundling Hospital. 1749 brought the first English performance outside London, um, which was appropriately enough here in Oxford. In 1759, Handel attended the Covent Garden Messiah on the 6th of April, um, according to one witness, apparently in great suffering, but when he came to his concerto, he rallied and kindling as he advanced, descanted extemporaneously with his accustomed ability and force. Uh, he died on Holy Saturday, died as he lived, a good Christian with a true sense of his duty to God and man and in perfect charity with all the world. That was according to a letter written by his friend and neighbor, James Smith, to Bernard Granville, who was uh, the brother of Mrs. Delaney. So a nice touching insight into the group of loyal friends that always surrounded Handel. His Messiah was the last music that he heard. We then move into the very briefest overview of the history of Messiah after the death of its composer. This is an engraving of the centenary performance of Messiah in Westminster Abbey. Uh, this was given in 1784, which of course, as you will all already have spotted, was not in fact the centenary of Handel's birth, which was in 1685. And indeed the memorial to Handel in Westminster Abbey still says 1684 on it rather proudly. Um, so uh, whatever the reason for that, and it might, it just might be to do with the fact that different countries in Europe change from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar at different times, although it's more likely just to be a mistake. Um, you can see that by this time, the habit had grown of performing Handel's works with enormous choirs and enormous orchestras, complete with trombones and brass bands and all sorts of percussion. Bernie described the din and stentorophonic screams of these truly savage instruments. And he also remarked in a letter which he didn't publish, I dare not say what I have long thought, that it is our reverence for old authors and bigotry to handle that has prevented us from keeping pace with the rest of Europe in the cultivation of music. And that's a very interesting observation from Bernie. England did not have a Mozart or a Haydn or Beethoven. And was it because we were frankly too stuck as a nation on the old idea of Handel and turning him into something that he never was? In Vienna, a, an enlightened nobleman called Baron Gottfried von Swieten introduced many important people, including Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven to the music of Handel and Bach at his Sunday Salon, something which was very unusual for the time where old music would have been regarded largely as um, hopelessly primitive and out of date. Indeed, Sweeten got Mozart to arrange and reorchestrate several of Handel's works, including Messiah, um, which sounds rather peculiar to us today. Mozart added clarinets and all sorts of strange harmony, uh, but that was the version that was used by and large through most of the 19th century. The process of Messiah getting bigger continued. Um, and this is a photograph of the Handel Festival at the Crystal Palace. And you just get some uh, idea of the sheer size of the forces there. Uh, in 1859, on the anniversary of Handel's death, Sir Michael Costa conducted a choir of 2,765, an orchestra of 460, to an audience of 81,319, a very precise figure. Charles Dickens attended the festival in 1874 and said people who complain that they cannot hear the solos are probably too stingy to pay for the best seats. Verdi attended one of these festivals and called it a gigantic humbug. But it's interesting to note that the idea of returning to something a bit more like what Handel had in mind began quite early. This is George Bernard Shaw in 1891. Why, instead of wasting huge sums on the multitudinous dullness of a Handel festival, does not somebody set up a thoroughly rehearsed and exhaustively studied performance of the Messiah in St. James's Hall 
with a chorus of 20 capable artists. Most of us would be glad to hear the work seriously performed before we die. And so we move into the 20th century and into the eventually the era of historically informed performance and the wonderful recordings and performances that we are used to hearing today. So finally, just before we leave Handel and his Messiah, just one or two reflections on some of the people around Handel. The Duke of Devonshire, Horace Walpole said, his outside was unpolished, his inside unpolishable. He loved gaming, drinking, and the ugliest woman in England, his Duchess. Walpole described the Duchess as delightfully vulgar. This is Susanna Kibber, better known as an actress in one of her favorite stage roles as Ancient Pistol. This is one of the many very beautiful portraits of the time of Kitty Clive, Susanna Kibber's stage rival and an important uh, soloist in Handel's company. This is Jonathan Swift, who was the Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral, who very sadly uh, lost, his, uh, lost his senses and went mad towards the end of his, uh, end of his life. This is Handel's great friend, Mrs. Delaney, who as well as being a great supporter uh, and a wonderful diarist and letter writer, was also um, a botanist and a wonderful um, uh, botanical um, drafts person. And these are some of her beautiful uh, pictures, well worth looking up. And here's the man himself in one of the two uh, beautiful portraits of him by Thomas Hudson. This one painted when he was already quite blind, although the painter has not uh, really um, captured that in this picture. Finally, what is special about this work? What is it called? Well, as you will have heard at the time, it was often referred to, including by Handel himself, as Messiah and sometimes the Messiah. I think Messiah is better, but we should remember that the 18th century was far less bothered about details like that than we are. What is it about? Jennings did his work with immense skill. The way that he combines ideas and sentences from one part of the Bible with another, sometimes changing the way that verbs are inflected to make a, a, a sentence from Isaiah, for example, fit together with one from the Psalms, as in he was despised, is incredibly subtle and beautifully done. But I think to finish with, what makes this work unique is that all of Handel's other sacred oratorios are narratives. They tell a story. Saul, Belshazzar, Samson, Jephthah. This one doesn't tell a story. What it does is it assumes that the listener already knows the story and invites the listener to join the composer on the librettist in a meditation on light and dark, often referred to life and death and on cosmic realities. It shares Jennings and Handel's idea of Messiah with you. Indeed, for a piece whose title is Messiah, the figure of Christ is barely mentioned at all, and of course never actually speaks. There are no named characters in the work at all. And that, I think, in the end, is what makes this work unique and special and lasting, together, of course, with Handel's inexhaustible music. Okay, well, um, thank you. Um, first of all, what I want to say is thank you to, to both our speakers. First of all, to Andrew for um, explaining to us so well the circumstances of the work's composition and locating it so clearly within the musical culture of the period. And to Martin for introducing us to the Tembury uh, manuscript and uh, indicating uh, the sort of information that can still be gleaned from it about the composition and performance uh, of the work. So I think we have some time for a few questions and there are several things in the chat, if I can just bring it up. Well, another technical question, is there a reason for the stems on some notes in the score being reversed from the norm? Um, I th to be honest, I think, I mean, Martin can probably say more than this, but I, I think this is an example of where we are just probably a little bit more fastidious about that kind of thing than the 18th century was. Um, you know, there, I mean, uh, notation has evolved, things like um, whole bar notes being put in the middle of the bar. Um, I, I think we're probably just a little bit more um, 
disciplined about that sort of thing. I don't know yeah, if Mark's... It's, it's, it's a bit like the spelling aspect of things, isn't it? And so, you know, many of these earlier composers would never have passed their grade five theory with uh, the way they notate things. But um, I guess I just think they weren't bothered about it. Exactly. Just didn't really matter. Yeah. We have a question about the instruments. Could you say something about the instruments used, oboes, bassoons, or whatever? Um, uh, yes, um, there, there, there is, now oh, let's see, I, I have to, I'm, not, I'm going to say the wrong thing if I'm not too careful. So again, Martin <laughs> might come in, um, but certainly um, Handel did use um, oboes and, and bassoons, um, but there is no um, separate music for them. So this is one of the interesting things about Messiah, you know, by comparison with his other oratorios, that there are no sort of elaborate obligatos for flutes or anything of that kind. Um, so it, it, it can be done with a very small um, ensemble, uh, and indeed often is. The word that's used sometimes is a sort of portmanteau oratorio, which means you can sort of carry it around with you. Um, but at the same time, I believe I'm right in saying that from the part books which Handel left to the Foundling Hospital, um, it's clear that, th that when he did use bassoons, he used quite a lot. I think there were four, um, although the instrument itself was, of course, much quieter than, than a modern bassoon. Um, so again, I don't know if Martin's got any further information about that. Um, no, not really. I think um, the these instruments are generally not recorded in the scores, as far as I'm aware, but as you say, the, the performing parts, uh, the sets of parts do include parts for such instruments. Mm. So they must have been used at certain times, but I think, uh, as I perhaps suggested earlier, and Andrew suggested that, um, you know, no two performances of Messiah were the same, really. So it evolved as time went by, and just depending upon what resources, I suppose, were available on a particular occasion to a certain extent. We also have a question about how the Messiah came to be associated, particularly with Christmas performance. Yes, that's an interesting point, that, because, of course, as I think you, you may have noticed, uh, Handel, Unique, would, would only ever have performed it uh, in Lent. Indeed, that's when the oratorio uh, season was. Um, and, you know, clearly had no difficulty in uh, singing about the, the Christmas part of the story and indeed other parts of the story during the season of Lent. Uh, it's not a liturgical work, so it wasn't um, tied completely um, specifically to um, the liturgical season. Um, but, you know, clearly part one of Messiah does deal with the, with, the, with the Christmas story. So that was something that came in later, but certainly not something that Handel himself did. Okay, thank you. Now, let me see. Um, yes, we have just a comment that the announcement of the Irish Premier referred to the Messiah, and so did Mrs. Delaney. Uh, but it's been noticed that nowadays we tend to say Messiah. And you, I think you probably answered that, that uh, this variation was permissible in the 18th century. Well, again, as Martin said, I think it's just one of those things where the 18th century was just a little bit more casual about this kind of thing, frankly. Um, I, I, personally, I think Messiah is better, and that tends to be what appears on, you know, publications, newspaper documents and things like that. But in letters, you know, um, lots of people who are close to Handel use the Messiah or Messiah interchangeably, even in, in the same letter sometimes. Okay, thank you. Well, most of the other notes I'm seeing here are simply thanking our speakers for giving us uh, such a wonderful uh, talk. Um, I have one uh, comment about the dating, pointing out that the, the date of the 23rd of February uh, 1684 is correct for its time, because down to 1751, England began the year on the 25th of March. Um, so uh, yes. that, that that's gets, from... I didn't go into that in some detail, but thank you whoever made that comment. It's Leah Frank Holford Revens has, has put that in for us, yes. Well, then I, I, I would not uh, not dream of arguing, but of course that that's absolutely correct. I, the, the question remains about the extent to which uh, Rubiac or the people who put on the uh, festival in 1784 uh, realised that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that. Yes, you're right. I mean, it was a hundred years after Handel's Handel's birth, so um, yes. Yeah, yes. Maybe it was a yes. <laughs> 
Yes. Sorry. I, I'm afraid I can't uh, see any more um, questions for the speakers um, on, on the chat that I'm, I'm looking at. So perhaps uh, we can um, end the session there by my just once again thanking uh, both of the speakers for their contributions today. I certainly learned an enormous amount because um, Dublin is actually my home city, and I was born not very far from where the uh, where the Messiah was was first performed. But I particularly love the detail of asking ladies to come without hoops and gentlemen without swords in order to increase the takings for the charity. And I think for the Friends of the Bodley, we'll have to work on that and try to come up with something similar for ourselves in order to in increase our, our income. But once again, both to Andrew and to Martin, thank you so much for what is really a fascinating um, uh, fascinating insight into the text. And I think many of us will be listening to our recordings of Handel's Messiah uh, tonight uh, more acutely than we would otherwise. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.